Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second annual Indigenous Peoples Day, celebrating here at East Carolina University. We are so excited uh, about this continuing program to celebrate the Indigenous communities that are within our North Carolina, within North Carolina. We are so excited. And in light of that, and part of our celebration, we have Miss Lenora Lynch, who is here and is going to talk to us about Native American art, its histories, and its ongoing legacy. We are so excited to have you here. We are so excited to continue our celebration of recognizing the Native communities that are a living community within our country. And we do this in replacement of Columbus Day. Columbus never made it to America, and what created a genocide of indigenous communities in the Caribbean. So we wanna take this time to take the day back to celebrate a thriving community within the United States and its rich history and contributions to the United States. And I'm going to turn it over to Alicia who will read ECU's land acknowledgement. Hi, we acknowledge the Tuscarora people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water and the air of Greenville. We pay respect to the eight recognized tribes of North Carolina, the Kahari, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Halawa Saponi, Lumbee, Meharan, Okanichi Band of Saponi, Saponi, and Wakama Suwan, all nations, their elders, past, present, and emerging. I would like to introduce Ms. Sonora Lynch, and she will begin. Hello, everyone. God be love. I'm poor at Methu Piho. In our language, that means hello, how are you doing? And you're welcome to be here. And we're excited about being here today. I'm going to be sharing with you my art, my traditions, the things that I make and do with my hands, and teach you a little bit about our tribe and the things that we're doing today. I first want to say uh, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. This is a very special day, especially for my, my life and my time. Forever we've called this Columbus Day. And I used to always wonder about this man who called us Indians. And, you know, over time, we've come to um, understand and take that name on, and many of our people still call ourselves Indian. But we want to acknowledge the uh, indigenous people, the First Nations, first people of this country. And we want to dismiss Columbus because now we know and we hear more history and truthful history that Columbus never really came here, which is kind of hard to accept sometimes because, you know, because of the... Um, the trauma and the brainwashing that we've come to know in our country. Um, you know, my mom would always say, we were always here first and they didn't discover America. We had already been here for many, many years and uh, we didn't come from anywhere else. We came from right here and came to this place. And so now in 2020 and 2010, um, um, Barclay College, they started to um, promote Indigenous Day more often. And now many of the states across the United States are um, actually renaming Columbus Day to be Indigenous Peoples Day. So we want to honor the natives who are still here and those who will continue to be here. I also want to um, just make a note of our land, our land acknowledgement that we are the original people. We want to honor our ancestors, our Tuscaroras, our Tudelos, the Pony. Nansamon, we want to honor our Lumbi, Wakamasuan, our Kaharis, our Meharans, our Okanichi, our Saponis from Carson County. We want to acknowledge all of our people, our Kaharis. I don't want to leave anyone out, but we have eight different tribes in the state of North Carolina who still thrive and exist in their own cultures, their own traditions, their own ways of being. And so we want to recognize that Mother Earth, the, the land that we walk on, as many of our arrowheads. And when you walk on this land along with us, um, you know that originally it came from our people, from our native people, and that you are walking on foreign land to your feet, but you also have to honor the people who gave up so much that you could live here in this country that we live in today, which was um, my ancestors and all the ancestors of our country. I like to take a moment to say a quick prayer. We believe in saying a prayer. I already had prayer this morning, but I like to say a quick prayer in, in my Tudelo language. 
Kuwaito, Sumali, Kelly Epion, Awasagame, Mililin, Alishkuya, Akwahan, all of Creator, we thank you for all that you've given us, all the things that you've done for us today, all the food and the water and all the air and everything that we need you've given to us. And we thank you. We don't always need the extra special things, just all that we need. We thank you. Um, <clears throat> I like to give honor to my mother, Magzella Richardson, my father, Daniel Richardson, my grandfather, James Mills, my grandmother, Tempe Mills Lynch. Um, I also like to give honor to my grandmother, Nora Elmora Rudd, who are major um, players in my life. My brothers and sisters, I have six brothers and sisters. And they have all made a difference in who I am and what my character is. Um, <clears throat> the things that I do come from them, the knowledge that they shared with me as I grew up as a young girl. I am part of the Holowoskaponi Indian tribe. And the word Kaponi means people from the red clay. And where we live, there's lots of red clay. And we know that there's uh, many nations named their, their sales after the land or location in which we live. And my pottery is made out of red clay. And you see on the table I have my pottery is also made out of white clay. So it's made out of two different types of clay. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in the Hollister community. I actually was born in Philadelphia in 1963. My mom and dad went there to um, get work, to have a job. In North Carolina, jobs were becoming very scarce and people were moving about and going out to different places. And so my mom and dad moved to Philadelphia to work. My mother actually said she worked in a candy factory like I love Lucy, like Lucy did. And <laughs> she would be wrapping the candy in a factory. And my father actually began to own his own business. He owned his own um, restaurant, his own cooking business. And so we stayed there for a little bit of time. Um, my father was in a tragic accident when I was two years old. And my mother moved us all back down to the country, down home to the Holocaust territory, which was really great for me now that I'm a grown person. Um, I'm really happy that, that we were able to move back home to our tribal community, which allowed us to uh, be a part of um, our family, our community, our, our um, brothers and sisters, our cousins, aunts and uncles. My grandfather, so it was really great that we were able to move back home, move back to North Carolina. And so as a young girl, um, I was uh, I was always interested in, in doing things and making things with my hands. And so when I was a younger girl, my grandfather, he was an artist himself. And um, I would go over to help him do his chair bombs and weave baskets. And I really learned a lot. From my grandfather and he would look at me and tell me that he would say you know you're really good you're really good with your hands you're really good at what you do and um and you should make things with your hands and he was an artist in his own right he made a lot of different stuff he was a um, carpenter by trade but he also made his own house mover he invented his own house mover he invented his own glass casket. He made a glass casket when he was a young boy. I think he said he was about 19 when he first started on it. And he made his uh, own glass casket that he was buried in. So he was always one who talked about ideas and thoughts and dreams and things that he wanted to do. And he would share those things with me. And so um, I think through him, I began to understand that I had a place or a belief in doing my art. And one of the items on my table today is a very important item. And this is um, a jewelry box that my grandfather made out of um, a sweet gum ball. And this comes from a tree. Our people would actually eat the chewing gum, um, chew it um, through the seasons. Whenever the sap was rising, our people would actually chew the chewing gum for, for health. It was considered really good for us to eat. So this is a jewelry box made out of sweet gum balls and he hand fashioned the, the wooden part. And I have some really kind of sacred things on the inside. I won't really open it, <laughs> but I have a lot of things on the inside that are important to me, like arrowheads and some arrowheads that he gave me. I have a, a rock and stone in there. I have some other personal items, some of my hairs in there. 
So, you know, that's another tradition we're taught to keep our hair and burn it. So that's, a, that's another whole element of tradition. But this is a, a very sacred um, piece of his art that I have. I'm very happy to have it. This is another one of his art pieces. It's a belt that he made out of um, walnuts, black walnuts. And he would dye his baskets and things with the walnuts. And um, so this is a belt that he would slice the little walnuts, walnuts and make an actual belt out of it. So those are just two of the things that I have that I brought with me today that I treasure that come from my family that I, I think is my beginning of who I am today. Um, <clears throat> then of course I have lots of pottery with me. Um, but uh, when, I was a, when I was a little girl and I would go to school, I went to Hollister Elementary School I didn't really like school very much. I was um, picked at and teased, and I felt like I had to fight every day to be Indian when I was in school. We had, um, I think we were facing a time when a lot of people were just going off of history books and the things that they heard about Indians. And I, was, I went to school with teachers who would say things like, there's no such things as Indians, and Indians don't exist anymore. And, all of the people left and went to Oklahoma, went to um, Ohio. People would say, you know, um, there's you don't have your tradition, you don't have your culture, but we know who we were. We always fought to be Indian, and so we held on to that for a life. And now today, you know, we can call ourselves out and recognize who we are. You know, for for many years, the history has um, miswritten things about our people. And so when I went to school, I didn't really, didn't really like school so much. But uh, I was always doodling, always drawing on the edge of the paper. So I was always having a pen and paper and always just playing around drawing in school. And, and, and so I think I just picked up on that and that became part of um, the gift that I have today. When I first started doing pottery, I really never thought of myself as an artist. I used to just, um, when I was a little girl, we used to play in clay. We used to dig up mud and make little cups and bowls and little saucers, little ashtrays, we would call them. We'd make mud pies and, and um, we'd play in the dirt. And then um, we used to make these little mud pies and just wait for my uncle to come and roll them over. And that was like fun, something we did for fun. But um, I had, had a cousin named Fitchy, and he was the only one around who had a car. And when he would come see us, he'd run over our mud pies, and we thought that was the funnest thing in the world. But I began to make pottery. Um, I think that was my first joy of playing in the clay, getting to know Mother Earth, getting to know the dirt and the clay. And so that was my first feeling of knowing about mud and dirt and clay. But my grandfather, inside his shop, he had these um, pottery shards. So he had these broken pieces of pottery, he had arrowheads, and a few artifacts that come from our land there and he showed me the pottery and he said um this is the way our people made pottery um this is how they would shape it and they would use corn cobs and nets and and baskets and things like that to create the designs and so when he started showing me pottery i think somehow that spirit of that of whoever made those pieces of pottery just kind of connected to my spirit and so I began to make the pottery that I have now. I, um, in the 70s, our tribe, the Hallwalk Corn tribe, we were reviving our pottery. So for many years, we always think that, you know, we like to think that our people never really lost things, that they kind of put them away for a while. So for many years, we didn't make the constructive pottery and the historical pottery that we did. You know, there came a time in history where we had to put all of that away. And so um, over, over time, we started reviving our pottery. And I started taking pottery classes at the Hall of Oklahoma uh, Indian School. And um, our elder women were actually uh, making pottery. And they, they would um, roll it and shape it. And then they would tell me, they would say, just, just use your hands like this, just roll the clay like this and push it out and, and um, roll it around and mend it and get the water. And so the women were um, making pottery, and I began to watch them. My husband and I both, we were young people in the tribal community that um, 
we were very interested. And so we would always get asked to come and help. And so we would go help them carry clay and carry water, clean up, do all the dirty work, be a gopher. And so we would, um, we would do whatever they wanted. So in the meantime, by watching them, I began to see them shape the pieces of pottery and start telling me how they would do it. And I took that knowledge. And then in my life, I made pottery. I started when I was 14. And I just did it for a little bit of time. And then, you know, school and education and going into the world and working and getting jobs, I moved about. And, um, and all my time away, it was like the place that called me back. It was like, you need to make pottery. You need to make pottery. You need to make pottery. So this voice was inside of my head telling me to, to, um, to start going back into making pottery. So now I was, um, I started making my pottery again in 2000, I mean in 1992. Um, we had another pottery class and we had a man named Alan Evans who was teaching a pottery class. And I started learning under his tutelage. And he would, it was really interesting because he would say to me, you made pottery before, haven't you? And, you know, I really didn't remember at the time, but then as I kept working on it, I started remembering that I had made pottery when I was a little girl. And so then I started developing um, my style of making pottery. And this piece right here is an old uh, replica of a, of a face pot. And this was um, it's called in Mississippian period. And this was actually one of a replica from a mound in Ohio. And when I was making this piece of pottery, I knew I wanted to paint the other clay on top of the clay. And so um, Alvin and I, we mixed up the red clay together and um, I painted it on here. And this was my actual first time of creating my signature of the pottery I make today. So this is when I scratched through the clay and my name went through and I said, that's the way I'm gonna make my pottery. And so ever since then, this was in 19, 1992, I changed my signature. I've always put the oak leaf on here. This is 1992. I always saw my work with Wico Core, which is my given name. It means water flowing gently over rocks. I saw my work with Hollowatsa Pony and my name Sonora Lynch. But this one was the one that got me started with these concepts that I do on my pottery now. Like I said earlier, I used to do pottery with the older women, Miss Betty, Miss Nettie, Miss uh, Velma. They were some of our elder women, we call our grandmothers. They were making pottery and um, that's when I first learned the joy of doing the art. I am um, actually now, I've taken my work, I've been uh, working at this now, I guess about, I guess if I had to put it all together, it'd be about 38 years or so. But now since 1992, I've been at it on a regular basis. And um, <clears throat> I go into a lot of schools and I teach a lot of students about our tribe and our art and how we're still um, con um, continuing to do our art. It's funny because I try to overcome some stereotypes. So when I go to the schools, one of the kids said to me not too long ago, he said, did you ride your horse here? I said, yep, I sure did. I rode my black shiny Mustang. And of course he didn't know the difference, but when he, when at the end of the show, he got to go with me out to my truck to put my stuff back in there and I had a big old black truck and he thought that was the most awesome thing in the world. But it's funny how kids, even today, still have these images and ideals about the lifestyle of uh, American Indians. And so I had one kid who asked me, um, what is it like sleeping in a teepee? Um, one child asked me, what was it like walking on the trail with tears? And so it's interesting how people still think of us in the past and not in the future. So when I go into the schools, I bring the clay, I bring the, the, um, the talks about our tribe, our history. And for me, it's really fun. That's probably one of the best things that I do. I think when I go into, and I, I don't just go into the native schools. I go into diverse schools all over the world from, from the top of the line schools to, to some of the lower graded schools. But I teach, I treat them all the same and I teach them all the same. Um, <clears throat> they have different levels of education that they're learning, but 
I try to work with them and just try to bring happiness to them. You know, so they don't just look at it, Indians as people who murdered and killed and, and did all these terrible things, but they know that we, we are living, surviving, and um, we still have our beautiful art and our traditions that we carry on. So that's one of the things that I really like is going into the schools and, and working with some of the students. Okay, so I was thinking about, um, you know, I talked about a little bit about who taught me and how I learned, and then I think about, you know, what really inspires me and inspires my art. Um, <clears throat> my daughter, of course, inspires me a lot. <laughs> when, I make, when I'm working on pottery, she really loves to come through and points out my errors. <laughs> She'll say, you know, hi, Mom, that pot's kind of crooked there, or you need to straighten this one up, or she might say, I think this design would be good for this pot, or, Oh yeah, that would look really nice with this design. So it's really cool that she is um, picking up the skill and having an eye for the art. Um, so she started making pottery herself when she was what, about three years old. And I got these little tiny bowls that she would stick her finger in and spin it around and she made these little teeny tiny bowls and I still have them today. One day I'm gonna give them back to her, but um, I'm inspired by her and her, her desires and her interests. Um, it's just fun to have her beside me to make pottery. She comes home now and she'll help me roll out clay. Um, she'll help me trim it. She'll help me paint it. And so she, she really plays a big part in my making of my pottery. My husband does as well. He does all the firing. He takes care of um, the drying process, setting it out, rotating it, make sure it dries. And then he does all the firing. So he's, a, he's part of my inspiration as well. I couldn't really do it without him. So I'm happy to know that he's, he's here with me. So I'm also inspired by um, my dreams. A lot of times my designs will come to me in dreams as I um, listen to our, our stories. And some of the people call them old sayings and superstitions. As I listen to those old sayings and stories, I, I'm inspired by that knowledge. And that knowledge helps me to bring the designs into my pottery. Um, I'm inspired by a tree. Sometimes I'm inspired by a color. I can look at a color sometimes and it's a piece of pottery that just form right in front of me just from looking at a color like green or blue or any color really. Um, many colors will inspire an idea or, or design. I dreamed about a lot of my work as I hear the people talk about, the old people talk about our superstitions and our ways. Um, I'll hear them talk and, and then at night, the night sky comes to me and these dreams and thoughts and pottery starts developing in my dream. Sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night dreaming about a piece of pottery and I'll get up and start carving it. Try, I try to draw it out, but oftentimes when I draw out my dreams, it really doesn't look anything like my dream which is kind of interesting, but I, as long as I keep that piece of paper, I can reflect and go back to that dream. And so that dream will take me back to that piece of pottery. And um, what I love doing is just listening and not taking anything for granted. It's like when my elders um, talk about how they were brought up, um, how they were raised, um, how they lived on the land, how they hunted and fished, and how they believed in different signs. Um, those are the things that inspire my ideas. Our people believe in a lot of spirits. And people will talk about the spirit of the clay and the spirit that comes on you when you're working with the clay. And that we believe you know, in spirits when the wind blows or when the door comes open, um, when certain birds fly by. Uh, we have old sayings of, um, uh, traditional ways that I take and say, oh, that's our history. That's our tradition. And oftentimes, you know, through listening to old people tell their stories about beetles and bugs and, and ants and bees and things like that, that's our history. And you hear people talk about living on the land and running through the woods and playing, playing with the trees and playing with the animals. That is our history. You know, they talk about old beliefs and how we traveled and how we survived. 
Um, that's all of our history. So all of that, all of those kind of things go into my art. And that, that's what inspires my, my thinking, my design. Um, I remember one night me and my husband was in bed and I was dreaming about a piece of pottery. And while I was asleep, I started blowing like, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm making a piece of pottery. <laughs> so while I was laying there sleeping, I was actually working on a piece of pottery. So a lot of my thoughts and ideas come to me um, through my dreams and through inspiration of, like I said, old sayings. And we, we call them superstitions nowadays, but they were actually true beliefs. So they weren't just things that people said, they actually believed them. And so I began to put those kind of ideas and thoughts into the clay and into my work. Oh, uh, now I actually um, sell my pottery. I didn't start it out um, to make the sale. I first started doing my art just because it was something our people did. And then I remember um, early on in my life, people would say, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I, uh, I make pottery, I do beadwork, I do some painting. And they said, oh, you're an artist. And I said, artist? Hmm. Never really thought about being an artist. Never really put that title on myself. And then later on, people would say, as my art career continued and I stayed into it for several years, people would say, oh, your art career is really taking off now. And I thought, oh, I have an art career. I didn't know I had a career in art. And so now I um, take my work to different places and I sell it. I sell at galleries and gift shops and stores. And I go to festivals and shows and I show my work and I sell it to the general public. And it's pretty amazing that um, people do buy my work. People buy it and they love it and they collect it. I have some people who collect my work. They come by every year to buy a piece of pottery from me. So. One of my collectors has a huge armoire in his house. And geez, he has, I don't know, more than 100 pieces of my pottery. And um, some other people um, collect my pottery to come back year after year. And so now I've taken my tradition and made it my job. So now this is what I do. This is what I do. So I, I sell my work and then I get paid to go into the schools to teach about my art. And um, so I've taken my work into the next level. So that I can, um, you know, actually not just enjoy making the clay, but actually take it into my life so I can sell it. And people really do enjoy it and love it. And I'm very thankful for that. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I've known some questions for myself because I thought, how am I going to talk about myself today? I somebody asked me a bunch of questions. <laughs> well, we already so, have two questions if you want. Okay. The first one was, what was the significance of burning your hair? Oh, of wow. burning, burning hair. Okay. Um, well, my mother would always tell me to burn my hair. She would say, collect it together and put it in a fire. You know, and we always had a fire. We had a big old buck stove and we always had a fire in our house and in our yard. And so she would say that it, um, if the birds would get hold of your hair, it would drive you crazy. And that if you um, didn't take care of your hair, you would become forgetful. And so she would always feel as it was important that we, we took care of our hair and we burned it. Next question is, how long does it take for you to create a piece? Okay. Well, um, it depends, of course, what size or how big the piece is. Sometimes I'll work on four or five turtles in one day and I'll make them and then shape them and the next day I'll trim them, next day I'll paint them, and the next day I'll design them. So if I had to take one turtle, I would say I have about four hours into most one single turtle. A big pot like this one took me about almost a month to finish. So this one has about 20 coils on it. So it just kind of depends. This one I let dry for about seven, eight days. So I'm always keeping my eye on it. Even though my hands may not be on it, my eyes are always on it. So it can take anywhere from three hours. One piece I created was a wedding vase. And I actually dreamed about that four years before I even made it. And so even though the piece wasn't being made, for four years straight, my mind was constantly going back to that piece to create it. 
And then finally, I did create a wedding base with these birds that sat on top, these leaves that went around it. And as soon as I made it, I took it up to an art show in Rancocas, New Jersey, and it sold right away. And I didn't even hardly have a chance to really hold it uh, or hug it, and it sold right away. So uh, that one took me took me about uh, four years just to come up to finally birth it out. So it kind of depends on which piece I'm working on. The next question is, do you sell online or it just at craft shows? That I, I am very old fashioned. I'm going to have to get hip to the modern day. I'm going to have to start selling online. Uh, I'm going to have to start loving a computer. I never really loved a computer. <laughs> but, you know, like one, one person said, you can't make any pots if you're on a computer. So the computers can take you away from who you are. But uh, I sell right now, I sell at craft shows, mostly at the North Carolina State Fair, the Museum of History. People do get my contact information. Uh, they can come by to see me. I'll take all of my pottery out and display it and show them. Um, I'm getting ready. My daughter and I, we were talking about putting up a Facebook page so we can um, be out there in the world today, especially with um, everything that's going on with COVID right now. It's um, It's been very challenging. It's been very different for me as an artist because I was feeling red steady to go and um, starting to do more shows. I had set myself up for many shows this year. And then it all got canceled. So I'm going to have to reinvent the wheel, as they say, you know, reinvent the wheel and start selling online. So, what temperature do you fire your work in the kiln? Okay. Um, yes, it is kiln fired. I do do some traditional pit firing also where we fire in the ground. But the kiln fire is usually like a cone four, and it can get up to um, 2,800 degrees in the kiln. So, it can get pretty hot. And it's, it's an all-day job firing pottery, and you have to wait. It's like 16 hours, and you can fire for about eight hours, and then about eight hours later, we take it out and it has to cool down. And then it goes through another whole cleaning process. Okay. Do you just make pottery? I first, my very first art that I started doing was um, doing chair bottoms with my grandfather. And he taught me how to do white oak slant bottoms and how to do reeds. I could wiggle weeds or reeds into the chair bombs and make baskets. Also, I learned that from my cousin, Mamie, who is my mother's uh, cousin. And so I started making um, baskets and things like that when I was just a little girl. That was my very, well, my very first art actually was I made a doll dress. And my mother showed me how to sew. And so I was just a little girl. We created our own doll dresses. And then my grandfather taught me how to do chair bombs. And then I started going to our Title VI Indian education programs and I started learning how to be. Now I make regalias, I make moccasins, I make lots of things, but my main art is um, pottery. I recently started making my own t-shirt designs too. Um, so someone made a comment, your pieces are magnetizing even seeing them in the venue and not being in the real physical presence of them. So I'm going to take the camera so that way we can show, like, show me if you want to talk about each one individually. Sure. So like I said earlier, I dream about my work. And this one right here is called Catching a Dream of a Lifetime. And it's a dream catcher with a turtle um, body shape. And I sculptured that. And um, that came to me in my dream. And I dreamed about these turtles were crawling. And as they were crawling, the web started to form in the back. And so the creator said, this is how you're going to make your dream catcher. And so I got up that next day and I started creating this particular piece. And this design on here is called Blackberry Winter. And after I, after I learned how to make pottery, I started teaching pottery. And so when I would teach pottery, I really loved when the women would come because they would just say stuff. And so one of our mothers was saying that in May, it has five moons, and on the fifth moon of May is when the black bear comes out, and he comes out looking for the blackberries, and so he's looking for his food, and he's coming out from his resting place, and so that's one of our um, sayings, that the black bear represents the moon of May, and that the blackberries are going to be full, and so that one, that's how that one came to me. These right here are called grandmother slippers, and I did those in honor of my grandma, who was a medicine woman. 
people would say they called her the Warren doctor and everybody from all over the, all over our community will go to her for her her knowledge on natural remedies and on the moccasin itself this has what we call a, a, a choke cherry design and the choke cherry our people would take the little twig and make it for as, asthma for people who had really bad asthma when they were having an asthma attack they would make a drink out of the out of the bark out of the little twig of the bark i also put the dogwood which is a sign of springtime and tells us when we can start collecting our medicine it has a pine tree which is for colds and coughs and sass for your throat corn our my grandmother would take the corn shucks and make bandages with it she would also take the corn and grind it up and make powder our baby powder and they would put that on any type of rash that people had we're taught that we should get up in the morning when the birds get up that's when the birds are singing is when the medicine is most alive and so the birds signify getting up and greeting the sun and being out there as soon as you hear the bird. This is called um, sweet um, flag root, which is very bitter. Um, they call it sweet root for some reason, but it's not very sweet at all, but it's a bitter root that's really good for your throat and your chest. Then we have our sacred tobacco plant, which is good for um, curing bee stings, um, wrapping wounds. Um, and then it's the birds and the berries, which is the, the grapes. And now today, everybody's talking about all the natural medicine that's found in grapes and in grape wine. And our people knew this knowledge for years. But she would always say how important the grapes are. And also how important honey is for the bees, for the bees to bring up honey. This one's kind of funny right here. Never done this before. And this is a chicken turtle. I had an order actually to put a chicken on a turtle, so I did, and so <laughs> she's going to pick this up sometime this week, but that was funny to me, to create a chicken on a turtle that, that comes from another world. This was one of my, actually one of my first designs that I really started creating. It's called Who's in the Woods, and who is your clue? So this is an owl. These are his eyes. This is his beak. And he's camouflaged into the leaves. And one of our old sayings is that the owl is a messenger. So he's letting you know that you need to spend time with someone before they pass away. They say that if he comes hooting next to your house, someone's going to be passing. And so I camouflage him because they said you don't see the owl. He never comes out in the daytime. So he's hiding inside the trees. But if he comes out, then he's a message. And so those are the type of um, sayings that I put onto my pottery. This one right here is um, a turtle with a cross. And I combine this together because, you know, I was brought up with Native culture, but also with Christianity. And some of the women around home, they were making some quilts and they would put this design in their quilts. And they said that it was called the stairway to the courthouse. And so I took that to mean that's the stairway up into the heavens. And so I put the cross to represent uh, the Christian way. So it's a way of combining the native tradition and the Christian tradition together. And this means that we have a good heart. So we're gonna all go to the happy hunting ground as my mom would always say. This one is um, a deer pot. This one also came to me in a dream. And for us, the deer is very important to our livelihood. We get clothing, we get food, we get um, musical instruments, we get our, our, our arrows. We make our, our bow and arrow out of the deer sinew. The swirl represents the spirit line, the spirit of the deer. And so I did this actually in honor of our men because usually our men, my brothers, they grew up hunting and they would bring home deers and rabbits and squirrels and they were the ones who provided the food. So it's all about um, being a good provider. And so we get, I got some of my pottery tools are made out of the antler. My grandfather would actually make glue out of the antler. He said he would take the tips of the antler and chop them up and boil them down and actually make a glue out of that. So I think that's pretty cool. This one is a big pot. And this one is called the gift. And this one has the dogwood for springtime, new beginnings, has the turtle design for long life. 
It has the tobacco for our spiritual medicine. The corn is our physical medicine. My grandfather would say these are our two sacred herbs. Is our corn is all about fertility. It's about preparing, preserving, saving, being ready for the next generations to come. Tobacco, our people would smoke. And he would say they didn't just smoke it like um, people sit around and smoke today. They actually would mix um, tobacco, flag root, mullein, and um, flannel together. And they would make a herb that they would smoke. And it was really good for your spirits, they would say, but it was also good for your chest and your, and your lungs. So it was really interesting how, you know, today we're on this whole movement on not on tobacco, but we really want to protect the tobacco because that's our sacred herb. And we have one of our um, tribal members, Mr. Lewis, he's one of our last Halawasaponi tribal members that's still growing tobacco. So we need to make sure we remember him and pray for him. This one is um, a hummingbird design. He's going up into the heavens. This means stepping up, like I talked about earlier, stepping up into the stairways. And um, our people believe that oftentimes we come back as birds. We come back into this world. So um, we come back as trees, come back as uh, different types of animals. And so the hummingbird is believed that it helps our spirit to find its way up to the, up to the sky. And then this is a turtle with the medicine wheel design symbolizing the four directions, earth, wind, fire, and water, our four uh, elements that we we know we have to have. We have to have water, we have to have air, we have to have wind, we have to have fire. And all of those elements go into making pottery. You have to have the earth to make the clay. You have to have water to wet the clay to work with it. You have to have the fire to heat it up, the sun to heat it up and to start cooking it. And then you have to have wind because whenever um, I'm making my pottery, I blow on my pottery and I'm blowing wind into it. So it's like blow, blowing your breath into the pottery. Over here we have a, a corn woman and she is sculptured strictly out of white clay where the rest of them are pretty much painted with the red and white clay. She has a wampum necklace and she represents the beauty of our women my mom would say that our, our women were always the one who were in the fields, taking care of the crops, taking care of the food, taking care of the babies and the children. And so the necklace represents her beauty, that in the midst of all of her work, she's still beautiful. And we see her as her beautiful self. This one right here is, um, I call that the woolen bowl. That was one of my earlier pots as well. It's made out of red clay, but it has a red iron oxide, and which is another a form of clay that darkens the clay. And so that one is um, red clay with red iron oxide painted on top of the clay. And that's one of my earlier pots as well. And then the big platter on the end is actually one that's been commissioned by um, Pembroke University. They have commissioned several pieces for me this year. And that one represents the dogwood flower, the corn. And if you notice, if you see my work, you will notice that I have my own style of doing the dogwood and the corn. Because I discovered from my mom, she would say, when the little leaves begin to bloom, the dogwood is coming out and it's time to start tilling the land. So we began to till the land, to break the soil, to plant our corn. And so these are messages from, from the earth that teaches us um, signs of the time, signs of the weather, signs of the season. And so it has earth, wind, fire, and water, the four turtles for the four directions. And you can see it has the water, the sun, the wind and the plant. So that's all about the four directions. Then I have the beadwork that's on the table. Um, those are some that my daughter and I, we do together and my family members, we work on that together. And um, those are some pieces. One set is hers that she dances with. The other set is actually a commission piece that we, we have made to sell. And uh, I've been beading ever since I was 12 years old. I started when I was a little girl in love I just love the colors of the beads. Sometimes I can just put my hands in the beads and just play and play, just ruffling through the beads. I just love the way beads are. And that, of course, we know was a trade item, the glass beads. We had originally had our wampum, but then we started trading, and then we started using glass beads. The next thing on the table over there is some of my t-shirt designs. And I started putting some of my art into t-shirts so you can 
um, you can call me up on Facebook or hit me up and say, hey, I want to get a piece of pottery from you or a t-shirt from you. It has the turtle, the deer, and then what I call earth and sky design. It's funny because when I was a little girl, originally I wanted to, um, originally I wanted to be a clothing designer. I wanted to make clothes, so somehow or another I'm coming around to it. I also make regalias, jingle dresses, leather buckskin dresses, um, leggings, necklaces, bone work, things like that. Um, how long did it take you to make a piece perfect in your detail? Mm. Wow. <laughs> I'm actually still working for perfect. I haven't gotten there yet. Every time I make a piece, I'm thinking, I should have done this or I should have done that. I should have cleaned it up more. I didn't, I'm always trying to reach perfect. I will say that when I was young, the only subject, two subjects that I liked in school was art and I finally liked geometry. I didn't really like it, but I finally got a good grade in geometry and I think, um, that balance and learning that balance has helped me to balance my work. I remember too when I was a little girl, my grandfather showed me how he could cut a complete circle out with nothing but his hands. So he didn't have any measuring tool, he just took his little hacksaw and he saw around until he made what I saw as a complete circle. And I think when I saw him do that, it set that concept of a circle in my mind. But when I make my pottery, I divide it in four and I start creating my designs based on four corners. And so I'll start on one side and the next side and then I'll begin to balance it together. Next question. Um, where do you give classes? Okay, so every year for so many years now, I've been giving classes at home at our cultural class with our students, our kids. Um, so I'm passing the tradition to them and hopefully that they'll pick up on it and they'll continue it and carry it on. So that's usually with our, our culture program, which is for our tribal community. Um, I'm hoping to build a gallery, a, a front store place where I can actually bring people in and start teaching. I taught for many years at the Hall of Sony School. Um, for several years, I would teach classes and people could come from all over. And then they turned that room into a computer room for the school kids. So I kind of lost my place to teach. So yeah, pray for me. I'm looking to um, build a, a shop so I can have people come and teach because I'm ready. Do you think people can make this pottery, pottery legitimate and be respectful if it is not their tradition? Yeah, I think, um, I think in the modern world, people can change and make things that they feel is part of who they are. And as long as they have the spirit and the, the good feelings inside of them, I think it'll come out into their pottery when they make it. You know, I do think people can respect it. Um, respect comes from yourself, to who you are. So once you have that, it goes into your art. What is your favorite free piece that you've created? Well, I, I, I would say my favorite, well, I call this one right here my boyfriend. <laughs> So that's my boyfriend, and he's been with me forever. And um, I'd always go back to that piece for some reason. I think Dreamcatchers, whenever I'm at the Dreamcatcher, it just, I just get so soothed and relaxed. And I just really love pulling out my beads and pulling out my ideas and my concepts for that. So I think that's my, my favorite um, thing that I make. This bear is my friend, my bear friend. I didn't talk about this one, but he is. He's my baby. Oh, his baby's my baby. Um, I don't know. He just has a peaceful spirit about him. But he is, he's called my brother spirit. And um, my mother would tell me um, that we, our people believe they could talk to the animals. And they said that the bear would teach them which medicine plant that they could gather. And on, the, on his feet, he has a plant called bear grass. And um, my elder would say that they would take the stem and make rope, and they would take this and make really strong rope and hang their meat in pack houses. But he's called my brother spirit. He has a deer, he has birds, he has turtles, he has a wolf, he has all these designs, and he's the strong one. 
So he's holding his people on his back. <clears throat> and I say this is probably one of my favorite because I haven't kept a lot of my own pottery, but this is one of the pieces that I'm keeping. A lot of the other ones belong to different family members. But that's one that I decided to keep. So it is, but they all have their own meaning, their own description. Sometimes a favorite piece may not even be what the public sees. Sometimes my favorite piece is how smooth the clay carves when I was working on it. Sometimes my favorite piece is just when I'm finished with it and it's fired and it came out right, then I, I began to just like that piece for that reason. So I may not like it in the same way or I might think of my favorite piece in a different way than, than other people might. Okay. Next question is, are you working on any new designs? That's a good one, too. You know, I found myself, sometimes when you do art, and you're making your art to sell, sometimes you'll find yourself trying to please the public and trying to make things that you know that they want and that they'll buy. So now I'm really thinking I really need just some time for me just to recreate, to come up with new thoughts, new ideas. And I think that's going to take some, some praying, some walking in the woods, some just some self time where there's nothing else that has to happen except for me to create new pieces. Well, that was all the questions that we have. Um, we can keep going. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Time? Yeah. All right, so we're going to shift over to a new, new location and we're going to get ready to do our pottery project. So those of you who have your clay, you can go ahead and get it up. All right, so today we can wave at Alicia if everybody's ready. We'll give them a few more minutes. Okay. So All you right. can get set up. And All right. If you want to talk about some of the stuff that you have in front of you while they're getting sure. their stuff out. So I have some other bowls here. That's kind of an example of we're going to be making a small bowl today called a pookie. <laughs> Everybody say that word 10 times, pookie. <laughs> and, um, and these are some of my tools that I have. Um, as this this place here is kind of clean compared to my clay area, my studio. I walk I work out of my house. I actually I say my kitchen table goes from a mud slide to a dining room table. When nobody's there, I have my pottery clay all over my table, and then when I know I have company or we're having a dinner or a family gather, and I just clean all the clay up and then um, put it away and then bring it back out again. So that's why I actually definitely need a uh gallery or workplace or studio but we're going to be um making what's called a pookie and, and these, what's the name of it again a pookie mm -hmm. a pookie yes mm -hmm. <laughs> a pookie is actually a vessel that is used to mold other pottery inside so it's going to be similar to this one y'all you guys are making a small one but I'll continue to talk about my tools and then I'll come back to that while everybody's getting their clay out. And you might want to get a paper towel, a uh, wet cloth or something like that. It, the clay will not hurt you. It will not stain your clothes unless, like me, it does stain my clothes because I use the same clothes over and over. But it will not stain your clothes. Um, I would wipe my hands off with a paper towel before you throw it in your sink. I would clean my hands first and then go back and wash my hands just so you don't get the, the clay to go down into your sink because you don't have a, a proper sink for clay. Um, just get comfortable and get ready and let your spirits go in. I always say a prayer over my work. I say a prayer over my clay. I say a prayer over the firing, giving thanks. But you can take a moment and have your own moments of prayer. Um, these are some of the tools that I've used forever. I think you guys heard me talk earlier when my grandfather first showed me that pottery shard in his workshop. It actually had the corn cob design. And he would tell me how they would take the corn cob and roll it and do impressions into the clay. 
We also had a piece that had like a checkered design and this is called a fishnet paddle. So the fishnet is, just like we have fishnets, when it's paddled onto the pottery, it creates this fishnet design. This one right here is um, a rope paddle. And if you study any of the old history pottery of North Carolina, you'll see a lot of these impressions into the clay. This is called a reed, which is pretty cool too. This is a deer antler. Um, this is a rock called a polishing rock. And then I use a lot of um, modern type tools too. Um, this is an old one though. This is one that's just made with with uh, it's a scratching tool we call a scoring tool it's just made with a uh, little piece of a pine tree and needles stuck inside this is one of my favorite tools that i use a lot it's a tin snuff can lid and this was one that was found in my grandfather's shop so i've had this a long long time this one is um scraping tool mason jar scraping tool really great for trimming and carving the inside of your pot this is one that um, one of our tribal members made for me. It's another type of scraping tool that's made out of a red oak tree. So if you notice, like, even knowing all the trees, the knowledge our people knew on which trees were strong, which ones were best to make tools out of, and which ones were great for pottery tools, these are seashells. You'll find that seashells in a lot of pottery. And this is a modern-day hand-carved wooden spoon. And then I use... This is a stylus or a drawing tool. This, this is the main tool that I use for carving all of my designs. All the background, everything. And it's, um, once I get started, I just scratch, 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 scratch. And, and I, um, I carve out all of my designs using that tool. And this is also another type of trimming tool. And this is a rolling pin that I use when I make big bottoms for the pot and I have to roll out big pieces of clay. I use a rolling pin. So this is the red clay and today you're really going to learn how to make a pookie. We don't have time to really go into all the details of making pottery but I will say that whenever I do my art and you know you hear people talk about getting your stress out. I never do that with my clay. <clears throat> so if I'm, not, if I'm not in a good mood I don't really work on pottery. I remember one year I, um, <laughs> as an artist and, that, and years and years of doing pottery now, you go through your trials. And I remember as an artist, I was thinking, you know, because all my life I've always done my work with a spirit thought in mind. It's like, and it's not really something that you say or know or do, it's just there. And so my mom would always say, that we always put our spirit into our work. And so for many years, I would do my pottery and um, I would work to put the spirit into my art. And then I remember one year I kind of got a little frustrated and I was thinking, I need to make money. I don't need to, I'm not making my pottery for the spirit of the pottery. I'm making pottery because I need to make money. And then I remember that year was my most challenging year. <laughs> I had a hard time making pottery. I had a hard time sitting at the table. I didn't want to create. And then the spirits told me I had to apologize to them. So I literally apologized to the spirits and said, okay, I'm making my pottery for the spirits. I'm not making it for the money because at the time I was just looking for, you know, I really wanted, as an artist, you want, you, you're making money, but you want more money, I guess you could say. But I uh, told myself, um, I had to apologize to the spirits and say, no, I'm not making this for the money. I'm making it, I'm making it because I was called or come to make it. So it really taught me a lesson. I had another challenging year where one year we were getting ready for the fair and um, I was working on pottery and three batches, like a whole kiln full of pottery, all broke. I did it again, the whole next kiln full of pottery all broke. And then the next one, and then the creator just said, just keep going, just keep working, keep working. And I just kept making more pottery, getting ready for the fair. And then when I went to the fair and sold my work, that was the best year we ever had. 
And you know, pottery teaches you lessons. You always learn with pottery. It's never, each time you touch the clay, it's always a new day. Each time you, you're, you're a new person every day, so your spirit is a new person every day. But every time you touch the clay, it's a new person. Clay has character. Um, it has veins. It has, um, it has life inside of it. And so every time you touch it, you put a part of your spirit onto the clay. And so, um, so it was a learning lesson for me. And I think what happened was I think I had a bad batch of clay and I actually think my clay went through a freeze. So in the wintertime, your clay can freeze and it can separate. And so my clay went through a freeze and I think it separated. So I was molding it and shaping it and pounding it back together. And when I was doing that, it um, actually started to separate. And, and so I think that, you know, every, like I said, every step in pottery is a lesson that we learn. Just like life. Will you show them the packets that they received? And yeah. So this is what you should have received. I came by to pick up. So you have your plastic bag and you have a little saucer, a little plate. And you're going to put your project on this plate when you're finished or you can work with it. You have your clay. Or else you have a bag of clay. What type of clay is that? A chunk of clay. This is an air drying clay. So it will dry in the air. You don't have to fire it. You can actually fire in the oven if you want to for a couple of hours. You know, you fire for, you can fire for up to six hours, but going on low, two hours, two hours, higher, higher, higher. So you can actually fire this in your oven if you want to, or you can take it to a pottery studio and they could actually fire it for you. But it's an air drying clay, so it will dry in the air and get very, very hard. So it should get as hard as a rock. Okay, so then you can take care of it. Who knows? I always believe in keeping my, you know, I believe in keeping my first pieces now, but I believe that your spirit is always drawn back to some of your first pieces. So I think that's important. This is for your water. So you're gonna need a little bit of water to stick your hands into your water to wet your clay. And then we have toothpicks. You can actually draw a design onto your pottery. And should the clay smell? Someone asked that question. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time, clay has a smell to it, but it's nothing too strong or too, you know, too hard on you. Um, you know, they say that you shouldn't really make a lot of pottery in in a closed area because of the dust and everything. I've been doing it for years. Um, for you for a day of making pottery, it won't hurt you. The same questions. Okay, so I'm gonna try to go, uh, I'm gonna make two pieces first. I'm gonna show you how it's done and then we'll make it again together. And um, <clears throat> with clay, you're gonna need to pound your clay or knead your clay together. <clears throat> so what I'm doing is I'm pounding the clay to get it round. Now, a pookie is um, it's a small vessel that our people would actually use to mold pottery on the inside. Some of the old um, ancient pots, if you notice, in North Carolina, they have a cone-shaped bottom. And the cone-shaped bottom was done like that for a reason. Um, when they were cooking in the pots, it would actually cause the heat to travel around the pot and cook the food a lot quicker and more consistent. And so... Um, <clears throat> So a pookie is a piece of pottery used to build another piece of pottery inside. It's also, some people refer to them as pinch pots. It's going to be in a pinch pot form, and then it's going to change. So you want to actually pat your clay and get it as smooth as possible, as round as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you do want to get it as nice and round and neat as possible as you can get it. And pottery is uh, it's always a learning lesson. It's, it's fun. It's joyful. You can mess up and start over sometimes. I don't tell that to school kids because I only have a minute and they can't restart, but that's the beauty of clay. You can. At different times, you're going to touch the water and you're just going to rub a little bit of water on the clay. You're not going to rub too much. If you put too much water on there, your clay is going to get all soggy. And a lot of people love water. They really use way too much water on their pottery. So what I'm doing is just rubbing it in here like a lotion, like you put some lotion on your skin. Just touch the water. 
and you know this this is um sort of based on your own body temperature some bodies actually absorb a lot of the water out of the clay so they need more water and you always have to get to know the clay getting to know the clay clay is very different you have to know yourself your strengths your abilities and you're gonna clay moves if you move it it moves so you don't want to you don't want to hit it too hard you're not trying to make it flat you're just making it round and I've already kind of decided like what's going to be the bottom. So I've already decided this is going to be the bottom. And you can see it's, it's not as round as the top. So I think first I'm going to show you just how to make a pinch pot in general. And then I'm going to come back and show you how to make some pookie because that way we'll have a better concept of working with the clay. Now some of you may have never touched clay before. This might be your very first time working with clay. It's so magical. I always say clay is magical. You can do sculptures. You can make animals. You can make vessels for ceremonies. You can make pipes. Clay pipes. And now I kind of have it to what I think of as round. It's pretty round. It's not perfect. And then I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to put a little pit in there. Just pivot it just a little bit. That's that's what I see as the center. Somebody asked me about the, my pots being perfect. And what I do is I look at my pottery like this. And I look for the center. And then I'm taking my finger and start twisting it and pushing it down inside the clay. So I'm drilling it around. And when you feel your finger going to the bottom, you don't want to push through or you'll punch a hole through the bottom of your clay. And so that's how it starts. So down inside. Just before I feel the bottom, you want to stop pushing your finger in. Now you're going to put the water in here at different times. I'm going to run it around like this because the top of the clay can sometimes start to dry. I'm going to push my finger back inside and I'm going to spin it. So when I'm spinning it, I don't want to let this hand grab it really tight. You just want to roll it kind of loose. And I'm rolling it and I'm letting my finger push the hole open. So I'm going to do that again. And at different times, you're going to need water because your finger will stick to the clay on the inside. So after I get it open like this, then I'm going to take two fingers and push inside and start opening and it's better to just open it a little bit at a time don't try to try to just spread it wide and make a big pot right away just take your time and roll it you can see how it gets wider so i'm going to make it even wider than that and you may have noticed i switched my direction on how I was using my hands. <clears throat> and I'll take my finger and smooth it around. And of course, if you you know, with pottery, with hand built pottery especially, you have to go back and trim it and trim it and make the edges nice and smooth. And usually what I do is I'll let it sit. I'm gonna now I'm gonna put four fingers inside. Usually I'll let it sit and get a little harder. <clears throat> a little stiffer, the clay gets a little stiffer. And you notice I'm pushing it with this hand, but I'm not squeezing it.
this is the beginning of a pinch block. So that's that's the first step. If you learn the step, then you make the pookie. The pookie, the thing, is only the same concept. It's only about pulling the clay out and making the rim of it wider. Okay, so I'm going to show you that again because I, I know with clay, <clears throat> that's why our elders were smart. They would always do repetition. They would do things over and over every year, year after year after year. So we could remember. Okay, so I'm just getting it round, patting it. And some of your clay might get little lines in it like that, like that line, a little dips in it like this, or like that. And you're just going to keep working with it. I'm going to take my finger and kind of smooth it. A lot to learn about pottery like for instance like a lot of times when people see a little line like that they want to take the finger and smooth it this way but it's actually better to push the clay into it and smooth it that way also clay gets tired you can wear clay out if you overwork it it gets worn out and it won't work for you And you can make different shapes. If you notice the, the bowls on the table there, those are all pinch pot type bowls. This one's a little taller because I took the round ball and made it taller. That was a little shorter and that one's fatter. That took a bigger chunk of clay to make that one. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna make it as round as possible. Like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. And you guys are perfectionists out there in the world. And you're just getting it wet. I have a tendency to sort of get it a little bit more wet on the top because I know that's the area that I'm going to push against. So now I'm going to take my finger, find the middle, create a pivot. That's how we're going to start. I'm going to take my finger and drill it in like a spin and spin this piece of pottery at the same time. I'm going to wet the tip because I can see the clay is cracking a little bit. I'm going to open it up. And you can see I twitched my hand. But you have to do what works for you. Everybody's different. So I started opening it up with one finger. Now I'm going to take two fingers. And spread it open. See I got a little bit of a little bit of cracking going on, but that's fine. It's not anything important, it's just on the top. So now I'm gonna take three fingers. Notice how I'm using this other hand. And again, you don't wanna push a hole through the bottom of your pot. I just started feeling my hand get really close to the bottom. <clears throat> So, so when is, you're holding the pot, how are you holding your fingers on the inside? Okay, so my finger is leaning against the wall on the inside. And then this hand is really doing the work. This hand almost stays, they rotate together like that. Like that. Do you mind holding your hands outside the pottery? Like your fingers outside the pottery, like how are you holding them? Mm -hmm. So inside, they're going in. And this hand is rotating this way. And then this hand is pushing the pot that way. So 
for them to make uh, what's called a pookie. Uh, it has actually, um, it comes out wide. So now I'm only going to stretch out the rim. I'm not pushing down into the bottom part anymore. I'm only stretching out the rim. You can see it getting wider. So now I'm going to go like this. And that opens it up even wider. I'm going to go back and open it up. And you'll notice on the inside, it goes into a cone shape. It goes in like a cone. And this is how our people would make those cone shaped bottoms on their pieces of pottery. Now with the with the pookie, you actually want it to be as neat and even as consistent as possible. Because when you build your pots inside of a pookie, that's gonna make the difference in everything about your piece of pottery. So what I will do after it dries is I will go back and trim it and try to make it really smooth, as smooth as I can get it. See that? Everybody ready? Everybody ready? Thumbs up. Oh yeah, and then after I after you um after I make it, I set it down. And sometimes I'll rock it. And I'll try to see, you know, I'll try to set it up as even as possible. And when I'm making my pottery, like when I'm when I'm making a pookie now, I want this to be as even as possible. But when I make my bowls like these on the table, you can see this one I made smooth. This one I just left natural. And then this one I made smooth again. So, <clears throat> so it kind of just depends on how they come out. Sometimes I try to make them even and sometimes I just leave them just like they are. Is everybody ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do, if you notice when you got your piece of clay, it may be kind of round, it might be kind of square. However it is, you're going to knock these points down and get it going round. This is kneading the clay. You're getting out your air pocket. Clay has air inside and the air has to... And you see that right there? It's always good when you can see the things that could happen. That got all crunchy inside. So as long as I hit my clay towards that hole, it won't create an air pocket. But you do want to try to get it smooth because that can affect your pot once you start rolling it out, shaping it. So right now, everybody should be just pounding their clay, getting it round. Again, I'm going to use my hands to just move it over, move it over here. Go ahead and use a little bit of water. If you see where clay, your clay feels dry, go ahead and use a little bit of water. Rub it on there like lotion. When I'm patting it like that, I'm also cupping my finger. My hand, so it's cupping around the clay. Making music. <laughs> okay, does everybody have a round ball? Can you see that? No. Okay. So I hope everybody has their ball round or as round as you can get it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be pretty close to it. 
can't be lopsided. Otherwise, you know, the pottery can be whatever you want it to be. If your pots come out lopsided, I had a friend and all of her vessels leaned over to the side. And that was her style. So if your pottery comes out lopsided or thin on one side or thick on one side, it's all about who you are. So art is art. I'm still trying to reach perfection myself. Okay, so we're ready. So I'm going to touch the water, rub a little bit of water on the top. And you're going to look at your clay, find the middle, and make a little pivot inside the middle. Okay, then you're going to take your finger and you're going to start drilling it on the inside just slowly. Just a little bit. And again, just a little bit. If your finger gets really sticky inside, you need more water on it. And then stick it in a little further, spin it around. And you're just going to keep doing that until you, you don't want to feel your finger coming through. You, you have to have a sense of depth between the bottom and your finger on the inside. I would say it would be best if you left it about a, almost a half inch to an inch thick at the bottom at first. Because it's going to thin out as you do it. So we're going to take our hand. Spin it around. I'm just using my one finger and this hand over here is spinning it without squeezing it. Some people squeeze their clay and sometimes that's how you have to learn because you might learn first and squeeze it and then eventually you'll learn that your strength is stronger than you think and you might be squeezing it too much and then you'll learn to relax and just hold it. Just put a little water on there. Now I'm going to spin it again. I'm going to press, press, press and roll. Press and roll. Not letting my finger drill in just on the sides of the bowl. These are the side walls. So I'm press and roll. Press and roll. And sometimes, you know, I get a little faster. Sometimes the quicker motion kind of helps it. Uh, Move a little better. Can you see that little, that little thing right there? Just to let you see that. I'm just going to put some water on there. Hopefully, that won't cause me any problems in the future. But it might. So then I just take my finger and just kind of roll around there. Look at that. Okay, so now we're going to put two fingers in there. Not going deeper, just pressing on the sides, on the wall. I'm spinning it. Then I'm going to wet my fingers. I'm going to put three fingers inside. I'm going to spin. Pressing only against the wall. Not the bottom. Now, while I'm pressing it on the walls on the inside, when my fingers were pretty down in there like this, I'm going to pull them out a little bit. They're not as deep. I'm going to start pulling my clay out wider. <clears throat> wider. Y'all might have noticed I switched my hands there. I went like that and I came back like this. Now I'm just getting wide. Now if I was just going to make a pinch pot, I could stop right there and say, that's a pinch pot. But because I'm making a pookie, I have to open it up wider. <clears throat> so I'm going to use my hands. Now I'm pulling only on the top. Only on the rim.
and I'm keeping the inside like a comb. That's actually pretty good looking right there. And that actually came out better than the first one. So hopefully it's going good for everybody. I just take my fingers and smooth it down. Go around and around. And I'll spin it and look at it and go around and around. Now I have um, some sandpaper at home and after it sets like this for a little bit, it's not really ready right now, but just so you get the understanding, you can use a butter knife, you can use a kitchen knife, pocket knife, whatever you want, and you can just smooth this rim. Now I'll smooth the rim like this to make it. Just better looking, smoother. But like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect, it really doesn't. And this is better once it starts to dry, what we call leather hard. I think it's a little bit harder, a little bit stiffer. But if you're gonna if you're gonna continue and decide to go ahead and trim it more. As it, as it sits on your shelf, if you want to trim it and make it even neater and more perfect, um, you want to keep your eye on it. You can set it out for a couple of hours, feel it, see if it feels hard, if it feel, if still feels sticky, if it still feels tacky, then it's not ready to trim yet. So that's all about getting to know the clay, getting to know the clay, getting to know yourself. But you can trim, 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 and make it as smooth as possible. Like it's funny because even though I'm trimming it, it almost seems like it's not, it almost seems like it's making it worse. But it actually is making it better. Because I'll trim it and you see the little clay shavings coming off. So it is definitely trimming it. So it's trimming away this excess clay. And then on the outside right here, it's thicker. So I'll trim this away. And I'll trim this away and eventually, eventually I'll have it nice and smooth. And if your clay is starting to get little cracks in it, just take a little bit of water and put on there. And eventually it will be, it'll just come out just perfect, just however, however it's meant to be. Does anybody have any questions, concerns? Anybody want to brag on their piece of pottery? So if you, um, hopefully your pot came out successful. Um, this is, pottery is, it's a, it's a lifeline of learning. And if you walk away from it, you got to re-bring yourself back to it, but it never really leaves you. I, th I don't think pottery, working with clay, never really leaves a person. Once you learn it, once you touch that clay, you come back to it, and there's something about it that just brings all those memories back to you. Um, <clears throat> I'm proud to be a Hawaii pony, proud to be an indigenous woman, proud to have a tradition and a culture that I can share with others. Um, proud to know my children and my children's children are going to learn and keep our, our traditions going. Um, where it's really important that we don't lose ourselves and don't get lost into this modern day world and forget where we come from because there's nothing like touching the earth. I believe it's important to walk through the woods, hug a tree. My mom used to tell me to go talk to the trees. Actually, I went and talked to a tree this morning before I came here, you know, asking the creator to bless my day. And I went and talked to a tree I called Grandma Cherry. <clears throat> so. She would say you could go to the trees and, and they would listen and they would talk back to you. So um, just remember that you can always go talk to a tree.
or pick up some dirt and smell the earth and be a part of Mother Earth. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here at ECU um, to share my art for Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, happy Indigenous Peoples Day and just remember who you are, where you come from. And hopefully I shared something with you that you can carry on through life. So go Pirates. We got one question. How long does it take um, for your pottery to dry completely? Okay. So they have the air dry. Uh -huh. It'll take about a good five days for it to, to completely dry. Most of my pots I let dry for about seven or eight days, but the air drying clay in, in five days, it should be really good and dry. And do they need to sit it on like a window seal, the porch, or just anywhere? Good question. You don't want to send it in a window seal. When I first made pottery when I was 14, I sat all my pots in the window seal and they all broke. <laughs> so I learned a lesson that the sun had baked it too quickly. So you don't want to sit in the window seal. You want to sit it on a shelf, maybe a dresser inside the house in your bedroom. Now we do dry our pots in the sun but you have to watch it you have to rotate them you have to keep your eye on it so for the air drying clay just sit it on a shelf in your house in your dorm in your room somewhere find a little spot in your closet and it will dry in about five days okay that's all the questions that we have um sean is going to take over now hi Again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and again, another thank you to Ms. Sonora for taking us through a wonderful lesson and giving us a lot of history. It was very enjoyable. So we wanna thank her again for her amazing contribution um, and coming to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day with us. Uh, if you check your chat box, I have put in an evaluation there for you. If you could please fill that out for us, it helps us to know how we're doing um, and what you're getting from this and how we can uh, improve moving forward. You, uh, we also ask that take pictures of your pottery. It's a really cool thing you got to do today. We would love to see your work and your efforts and all art is picture worthy. Um, so feel free to tag us at LWCC underscore ECU on Twitter or Instagram. If you're wondering about how you can view this later, if you want to go back and make some changes, if you felt like you missed something, this has been recorded and will be placed on our YouTube page. Um, so you'll be able to view it later. The other thing I want to share with you is I want to let everybody know that Indigenous Peoples Day is not over. We will be having a performance by Miss Charlie Laurie tonight at six o'clock, um, and you can get the link for that on Engage as well. So we hope that you will join us then um, as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you at six.